sejam de novo bem-vindos. Vamos dar início aos trabalhos. Ao longo do dia teremos várias apresentações que vamos tentar que não ultrapassem o tempo estipulado para cada um. Entre as intervenções serão abertos debates por moderadores que irei apresentar durante o evento. Poderão intervir os senhores participantes que estão a acompanhar-nos no auditório, onde temos dois microfones móveis para o efeito, e os que estão online através de chat e cujas perguntas lançaremos à mesa. Nos debates, solicitamos que os participantes sejam breves nas questões que colocam para facilitar a sua organização e permitir um maior número de questões. Vamos iniciar este painel com uma apresentação sobre confisco civil, NCBF, nos Estados Unidos da América. O debate que seguirá após esta intervenção será moderado por Oscar Solorzano, que é diretor do escritório do Basel Institute on Governance para a América Latina, em Peru, e é especialista sénior em recuperação de ativos no ICAR. É licenciado em Direito e Mestre em Relações Internacionais pela Universidade de Friburg, na Suíça. Obteve uma segunda licenciatura em Direito pela Pontifícia Universidade Católica do Peru, onde ocasionalmente leciona. Trabalhou como investigador e como docente na Universidade de Genebra, Suíça. Esteve envolvido em várias publicações e projetos de investigação relativos à corrupção de funcionários públicos, recuperação de bens, branqueamento de capitais, confisco e responsabilidade empresarial de entidades jurídicas. Autor de uma tese de doutoramento intitulada The International Asset Recovery of Illicit Assets of High-Ranking Public Officials na Universidade de Genebra. Passo-lhe agora a palavra a fim de apresentar o nosso primeiro orador. Good morning, everyone. And thank you very much uh, to, to the organizers. And uh, um, this is my duty, my task today to introduce uh, Professor, Prosecutor, former Prosecutor Stefan Casella, um, which is, as you may know, a very well-known expert in this field and a, and a personal friend for many years now. And so it, this is a real pleasure for me to introduce him and to have him today in this uh, very interesting gathering today with this specialist. Mr. Casella has been prosecutor for 30 years in the United States. He was the chief of the money laundering and asset forfeiture section at the Federal Prosecution Office in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, among many things that he has done in his life, Stephen Casella has drafted the law in the United States, uh, the non-conviction-based confiscation law. Uh, he trained the prosecutors, particularly in uh, money laundering and asset forfeiture. And now he is an international expert sharing and disseminating his knowledge. He has 30 years of experience in countries like Latvia, Malta. He's been in Peru many years ago, in Brazil, and now today sharing the, his deep understanding of this legislation as one of the drafters of the original law, uh, original law in the United States. So this is a great pleasure for me to pass you the, the floor, uh, Stefan, so we can hear, all of us can hear your presentation. Thank you very much again for being here. Oh, thank you very much. Is the microphone on? Yes. Okay, thank you very much, Oscar, for that very kind introduction, and thank you for um, inviting me to speak with you today. Uh, it's a privilege for me to be here. I have never been to Portugal before, and I uh, welcome the opportunity. Uh, to meet new colleagues and to answer questions and to share our experiences. I learn as much from all of you as I hope that you will learn from me as we can share information and I hope that we'll have that kind of discussion today. My topic is the critical role that non-conviction based forfeiture uh, plays in the enforcement of the criminal laws uh, and why it's important for countries to consider enacting non-conviction-based forfeiture legislation. So I'm going to talk about what I mean by non-conviction-based forfeiture, and sometimes I'll abbreviate that to NCB forfeiture. Um, and I'm going to talk about how it works in the United States and in other countries. And then um, most important perhaps, why it is useful and often necessary to do forfeitures as non-conviction-based forfeitures rather than making it part of a criminal case. And along the way, I will give some examples. Now, in the United States, as in most countries, uh, we have uh, the ability to recover two types of property, the proceeds of crime and the uh, property that's used to commit or to facilitate the, proceed, uh, the cr criminal offense, often called the instrumentalities. So proceeds, 
and facilitating property. And we can do this uh, in the United States for any crime committed in the United States, regardless of where the property is. And we can do this for foreign crimes if the property is located in the United States. So there, uh, it's a very powerful tool that applies um, in, in the international context. By the proceeds of crime, I mean that the property that the defendant would not have but for having committed the offense. If he robs a bank, the money that he steals is the proceeds. If he sells drugs, the money that he makes from selling the drugs are the proceeds. If he accepts a bribe or a kickback, the bribe or the kickback is the proceeds. If he obtains a contract by paying a bribe or a kickback, then the contract is the proceeds and any money that he obtains on the contract is the proceeds. So proceeds also includes anything traceable. If the uh, criminal commits fraud and uses the fraud proceeds to buy a yacht, the yacht is the proceeds and so forth. Uh, he steals public money and uses it to buy, uh, he steals public money in South America and he uses it to buy a condominium in Miami. The condominium is the proceeds of the foreign crime. Now, that's proceeds. And by property used to commit the offense, I mean anything that would be the instrument of the offense, such as the gun used to commit a robbery, but also any property that makes the crime easier to commit. Uh, for example, the getaway car used in a robbery or the warehouse where the drug organizations stored their drugs. In a money laundering case, it could be the business that was used as the front through which the money was laundered. Now, that's what can be recovered. How do we do it? In the United States, we can recover the property in either of two ways. Uh, as part of the sentence that's imposed on the criminal if he is convicted of a crime, and we call that criminal forfeiture, or in a separate civil action, a non-criminal action, that's not part of any criminal case, and we call that non-conviction based or NCB forfeiture. Now, criminal forfeiture is familiar to most people and will be familiar to most of you. The defendant is convicted in a criminal court and the court orders him to forfeit the proceeds or the instrumentalities of his crime. And if the defendant no longer has the money because he has spent it, if your legislation permits, then you would the court would order him to pay a non conviction based judgment. He stole a million dollars. You must pay a million dollars, even if the proceeds are not traceable to any property that he has in his possession at that time. That's called a value-based judgment. So that's how criminal forfeiture works. Criminal forfeiture is the more common procedure and that's what most countries are able to do. And certainly in the United States, we can do criminal forfeiture. Non-conviction-based forfeiture is less familiar. Um, it's an action against the property, not against the person. So in the United States, we actually name the property in the title of our case. And that's why our cases have what seem to be very silly names. The United States of America versus $125,000. The United <coughs> States of America versus the property at 123 Main Street. Now, just be, this is just a convenient way of letting the world know that this is the property that is subject to forfeiture. It doesn't mean that the property has to defend itself in court doesn't mean the property has to hire a lawyer. It just means that the government has said, this is property we believe to be the proceeds or property used to commit a crime that should be confiscated. And we let the world know that, it, uh, that this action is taking place and that anyone with an interest in the property can now intervene. So for example, if the government wants to confiscate $1 million in proceeds from drug trafficking, it would bring an action called the United States versus $1 million in drug proceeds and see who wants to intervene. If it wants to forfeit a building that was used in a money laundering case, it would bring the action against the building and see who wants to intervene. So in short, this is a procedural device to get anyone with an interest in the property into the courtroom at the same time 
to put the government to its proof as to whether this property can be forfeited or not forfeited and to raise any defenses they might want to raise. So the simplest way of explaining this is by way of a typical example. Let's assume that the police come upon a vehicle on the street and lying dead on the street is a drug dealer who was murdered when he exited his vehicle. And in the vehicle, the police find $90,000 in cash. They want to confiscate the $90,000, but they're not going to do it as part of any criminal case because the drug dealer is dead. So how do they do this? So the government would file an action against the $90,000 and say, who claims this? Now, perhaps anyone who responds can come in and, and litigate against the government, but who might respond? Well, maybe the drug dealer's widow comes in and says that she uh, is entitled to the property because it was joint marital property. Maybe his daughter comes in and says that she is his heir and she inherits the property. Maybe his business partner comes in and says, we were not in the drug business, we were in the landscaping business, and this is the money from our landscaping. Any of these people um, could intervene. In such a case, the government would be the plaintiff, the property would be the race or the thing that is subject to forfeiture, and anyone wishing to contest the action as an intervener uh, would have to come in and show that he has an ownership interest in the property. So in the case of my $90,000 example, the government would be the plaintiff, the $90,000 would be the race or the thing subject to forfeiture, and the dead drug dealer's widow or his child or his business partner would be the intervener who comes into court to lay claim to the property. Now, this is just one example, uh, a typical example, but only one example of something which historically we have been able to do in the United States for a very long time. The concept of non-conviction based forfeiture actually began in the 18th century when it was necessary to try to confiscate pirate ships or ships used in smuggling or slave trafficking. And you could lay hands on the ship or its cargo, but not on its owner because his owner was in some other country. He was in the Caribbean or some other place and we could confiscate or, or seize the property, but not bring the owner into court. And so they developed this concept of being able to bring the action against the property because the criminal who committed the offense was unavailable. And that's still how the United States uh, handles non-conviction based forfeiture today. And it's also the way that um, this works in most common law countries. Most of the English common law countries, England, Ireland, Australia, South Africa, uh, Canada, have non-conviction based forfeiture statutes. Kenya, I understand, is one of the leading countries uh, in, in um, Africa doing non-conviction based forfeiture. Um, and it works in virtually all categories of cases, drug trafficking, uh, fraud, other white collar crimes, uh, sex trafficking and child pornography. It's the tool the United States is using right now to seize the assets of Russian oligarchs, such as yachts, which are derived from criminal acts that were uh, committed by them or by others in Russia. And um, it is used um, any time a criminal prosecution is just not possible or feasible. In other words, we use non-conviction based forfeiture as a gap filler, as the instrument when we can't bring a criminal prosecution or shouldn't bring a criminal prosecution in order to recover the property. So I'm gonna talk about the instances where that's necessary in a moment, but first let me talk about the procedure, about how it works. So generally a non-conviction based forfeiture case begins with the seizure of the property. A police officer will, or someone will go to a judge and get a warrant to seize a bank account or an automobile or whatever the property might be. And the warrant would give the government the right to temporarily maintain possession of the property while the action is litigated. The seizure of the property is not the end of the process. It's the beginning. It just gives the government the right to immobilize the property while the litigation takes place. Once the property is in the government's possession, the government files an action 
naming the property as the property that is subject to forfeiture, be it a boat or an airplane or a gun or a bank account or whatever. And when I say the government does this, in the United States, and other countries do it differently, I understand, of course. But in the United States, the same prosecutor can choose between bringing a criminal action or a non-conviction-based action. And the action is filed in the same court. The same court that would consider the criminal case would consider a non-conviction-based case. Now, in other countries, they have different offices, do civil uh, and criminal matters, and different courts do civil and criminal matters. We combine. So I, as a prosecutor for 30 years, when presented with facts, could choose to, to prosecute the defendant, the criminal, and try to recover the property as part of the sentence, or I could bring a non-conviction-based action if that was necessary or more appropriate. And it would go to the same court before the same judges. Once the action is filed, we would have to send notice to anyone with an interest in the property, the titled owner, his spouse, a person with a lien on the property, anyone with an interest in the property. And we would uh, allow them the opportunity to intervene. Do they want to file a claim? Do they want to contest uh, the forfeiture? If no one files a claim, as often happens, who wants to claim this $90,000 in drug proceeds found in the dead drug dealer's car? Maybe no one does. But if no one, if no one files a claim, the property is forfeited by default. If someone does file a claim, however, then we have to go uh, to a judicial proceeding. Now, one of the most important things to understand about non-conviction based forfeiture is the obvious one, which is that it does not require a criminal conviction. It doesn't require a criminal prosecution at all. The government could bring a non-conviction based case before it brings a criminal case, after it brings a criminal case, while a criminal case is pending, or if there is no criminal case. It stands alone as a separate uh, proceeding. But here's the important point. But it is still a law enforcement tool. The government still must prove that a crime was committed and that the property was derived from a crime. It may happen in the civil context with civil procedures and civil burden of proof, but it's still a law enforcement tool and the government still must prove the crime and the connection of the property to the crime. And the government has the burden on, on both of that po those points. So for example, in my example of the $90,000 found in the dead drug dealer's car, it would not be enough for the government to prove that this person was a drug dealer. Yes, it would have to prove that. But it also must prove that this $90,000 was his drug proceeds and not money that he inherited from his grandmother or that he won in the lottery or obtained in some other way. So to repeat, the government, even though this is a non-conviction based case, still must prove a crime and must prove the nexus, the connection, the relationship between the property and the crime. Um, and whoever intervenes in that case has the right to put the government to its proof. Now, as you can imagine, if the government brings an action against a pile of money or a building, anyone who, who reads about it might try to intervene and say, I would like that money or that building. Um, Maybe in the case of the $90,000, someone just happened to be walking down the road when they saw the policeman find the money and he says, that's my money. So how do we weed out? How do we make sure the government does not have to litigate, does not have to establish its proof with someone who has no interest in the property? So there has to be some kind of, um, this is a significant problem in, in non-conviction based cases. And we, there has to be some way as a threshold matter to exclude people with no interest in the property, mere passers-by, the bad guys, creditors uh, who say, hey, that guy owed me money, so I would like to claim the money that you've seized from him. Um, the point is the government should not have to litigate with persons who have no interest in the property, and so there has to be this pretrial procedure for challenging claims by people 
with no, with no interest. And we call that a motion to dismiss for lack of standing. Now, assuming we get past that and the people who are intervening in the case really have an interest in the property, um, we move to the merits. And here's where all of the due process rights of property owners come into play. First, I already mentioned that they have a right to be given notice that the government is proceeding in this with this case. Then once we're in court, the government has to establish its case before some neutral arbiter, a judge, a court. In the United States, we have a right to a jury trial on non-conviction based cases, just as we do in criminal cases. Um, the, the property owner has the right to call and cross-examine witnesses, uh, to present evidence, to compel the production of evidence, um, to exclude evidence that's illegally seized. And in the United States, if the property owner prevails and the government loses, the government must pay his attorney's fees. So due process is protected uh, when these cases go to court. Now, if the government succeeds in establishing the forfeitability of the property, then the property owner has one more defense, an affirmative defense. Actually, there are two different affirmative defenses that he or she might raise. One, so you could say, all right, you prove that this property was derived from a crime or was used to commit a crime, but I acquired it later as a bona fide purchaser for value. Maybe you've proven that this yacht was obtained by some international drug trafficker, but I bought it from him for fair market value and I didn't know I was buying criminally derived property. That would be an affirmative defense, the bona fide purchaser defense. The other defense is called the innocent owner defense, and it applies to instrumentalities. I did not know that my property was being used by this criminal to commit a crime. For example, somebody uses his wife's car to rob a bank. He says to her, I'm going out tonight, may I borrow your car? She says, yes, he goes out and he uses it to rob the bank. The government proves the bank was robbed. The government proves that this car was used to rob the bank, but maybe the wife didn't know anything about it. So when, if she were to say, I did not know my car was being used to rob a bank, or if she were to say, when I found out my husband was going to use my car to rob a bank, I called the police and she's telling the truth and she can prove that, then she would be an innocent owner. Um, if she proves either of those two statements, then she would prevail and she would get the car back and recover her attorney's fees. But if she does not, if she's not an innocent owner, if her husband said, I'm going to borrow your car tonight, I'm going to go rob the bank, and she said, by all means, go ahead and do that, we could use the money, then she would not be an innocent owner. And the car could be confiscated even though she was not prosecuted for the crime. So it's one of the instances of, the, of, of several that I'm going to mention. One of the instances when the government would want to use non-conviction based forfeiture. It's a way of recovering property from a person who is not an innocent owner, but is not the person who committed the crime. A person who allowed her property knowingly to be used to commit a crime. And that's why it's being confiscated. So there's one other defense which I should mention, and that is that it's called the proportionality defense. And I know the European Commission on Human Rights is very strong on uh, in insisting that forfeitures be proportional. If someone, if the government proves that the property was used to commit a crime, but nevertheless, the relationship between the value of the property and the seriousness of the crime is very disproportionate that it may be that a court would find the forfeiture could not go forward. For example, there is a dead or fugitive drug dealer who used his girlfriend's house as the place to store his drugs. And she knew all about it and is therefore not an innocent owner. But the house is worth a million euros and he only had 10 euros worth of drugs in the house. In that case, the court would likely find that the forfeiture of the house would be disproportionate to the seriousness of the crime. And where you find the 
The balance, of course, is up to the judge to determine that. So in short, the proportionality requirement is another way of ensuring uh, due process. Now, just to summarize the procedure, it should be apparent by now that there are three phases to a non-conviction based forfeiture case. First, as a threshold matter, determining whether or not the intervener has standing. Second, the government has to establish the property should be forfeited. How? By proving a crime was committed and that the property was derived from the crime. And third phase is the affirmative defense where the property owner says, but I acquired it as a bona fide purchaser or I was an innocent owner. And the burden shifts back and forth. The burden is on the property owner at the beginning to show that they really have an interest in the property and that they're not a mere passerby. The government, the state, has the burden of proving the crime and the connection between the property and the crime. And then the burden shifts back to the property owner to establish the affirmative defense, the offenses that I've mentioned, including the proportionality issue. All right, so in the last couple of minutes before I conclude, let me just give you my list of the instances when non-conviction based or NCB forfeiture is critical or, or uh, even necessary uh, because we don't have any other way of recovering the property. Maybe the forfeiture is unopposed. There is no, the property has been seized in the course of uh, an investigation and no one comes forward to claim it. A non-conviction based forfeiture proceeding is a very efficient way of disposing of the property without having to wait until there's a criminal trial. So number one, cases that are unopposed, and those are common. Number two, where the wrongdoer, where the criminal is dead or is a fugitive or he's incompetent to stand trial uh, and he can't be prosecuted. Uh, recently in the United States, we had a sex trafficker by the name of Jeffrey Epstein who hung himself in prison before he could stand trial. In order to recover the property in that case and use it to compensate the victims, we'd have to bring a non-conviction based forfeiture action because he's dead. Uh, third, where the defendant is a fugitive or is a foreign national beyond the jurisdiction of the court. Recall in my example, the earliest cases involved pirates and slave traffickers and smugglers. The same is true today. Uh, the person may have committed a crime in the United States and then fled to Pakistan or Mexico or, or wherever his native country is. Or the property uh, may be um, you know, left behind uh, by any number of other criminals uh, in the United States who are un unavailable for forfeiture. Or the property may belong to a foreign criminal, a corrupt uh, a public official in Mexico, say, who invests his property in the United States. And then we use non-conviction based forfeiture to recover it, even though he is beyond our jurisdiction. Number four is when the statute of limitations has already run on the criminal case and we can't bring a criminal case, but we've now found the property. Uh, number five, where we know a crime has been committed, but we don't know who committed it where we find a murder weapon at the scene of a murder, where we find uh, stolen property, where we find drug proceeds. And it's obvious in all respects that this is the proceeds of the robbery or the, or the murder or whatever it might be, but we don't know who did it. We can't, that, that person has left and, and there's no evidence as to who it was. Um, that happens a lot when we find paintings that were stolen from museums or were stolen by the Nazis during the Holocaust or uh, we find um, money seized from a courier. There's a courier driving down the road. He has $100,000 in cash in his car. He doesn't know anything about why he has it, except that somebody that he met on the street corner paid him $100 to drive this car. It's not his money. We don't know whose money it is, but it's obvious that it's criminal proceeds. And that would be an instance where we'd bring a non-conviction based forfeiture action. Sometimes, this is number six, the defendant has pled guilty to some other crime. He can, he's convicted of, uh, of uh, drug trafficking, but he did not plead guilty to fraud. And there's also a fraud uh, involved, and we want to recover the proceeds of the fraud without having to bring a separate criminal prosecution. And related to that, number seven, 
sometimes the person has already been convicted in another court. He may have been convicted in Portugal of being a corrupt public official, but his money is in the United States. And rather than bring a separate criminal prosecution, even if we could bring one, we would just bring a non-conviction based case because there's no point in bringing a separate criminal prosecution against a person who's already been convicted and is already incarcerated. Number eight is when sometimes the interests of justice don't require a criminal prosecution for a relatively minor crime. It may be that the fair thing to do is just confiscate the property and not bring a criminal prosecution. And I could give you examples of that if anyone's interested. Um, number nine is a, sort of a, a special case of my uh, suggestion that sometimes we don't know who committed the, proper, uh, the, the offense. Sometimes we know that the offense was committed by one of a, of a group of people, but we don't know which one. You find guns and money and drugs in a car and three people in the car and each says it belongs to the other guy. And we cannot prove beyond a reasonable doubt which one is telling the truth and which one is not. But we can prove to the civil standard without any doubt this property, the gun and the drugs and the money are criminal proceeds or instrumentalities and should be confiscated. Uh, number 10 is the example I gave earlier about someone else's property being used to commit the crime. Someone uses his wife's car to rob the bank. Um, and finally, uh, the number 11 is instances where the criminal investigation will take a very long time to complete. It may take years to bring a corrupt public, public official to justice. But in the meantime, it may be possible to bring a non-conviction based asset uh, forfeiture action to recover his assets. So uh, Oscar, that concludes what I wanted to say. I mean, in summary, I would say that I, I, I'm trying to make the point that non-conviction based forfeiture is, is critical. It's a law enforcement tool, but you don't always need a criminal conviction. And if you can use this tool in instances where a criminal conviction is not possible, it's really, really <laughs> helpful and sometimes absolutely necessary. And I'm happy to answer your questions, Oscar, or any other questions during the course of the day today. Thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, I think we're having a... Uh, I will be presenting now in, in Spanish, so uh, you have the time to, to use your earphones and uh, maybe the presentation will also be on the screen soon. Um, en realidad, lo que quería mencionar eh, y la idea de traer al, al profesor, al ex fiscal Stefan Lenz um, a esta reunión es eh, porque hay demasiados modelos de decomiso sin condena ahora en, en el escenario. ¿no? Y para los países como ustedes que, están, que tienen el propósito de adoptar leyes de su naturaleza, nos ha parecido conveniente Volver a los básicos. Excuse me, Oscar, we're not getting an English translation. Uh, parece que no, no están traduciendo al inglés. ¿Podrían, por favor? Uh, entonces, decía, eh, la idea de traer a, a los Estados Unidos, la idea de traer al, al, al profesor Casella, es porque creo que en algún momento de la evolución de nuestras leyes, es necesario regresar a lo básico, ¿no? al elemento central que motivó en algún momento a los legisladores a adoptar este tipo de leyes. Y el doctor Casella evidentemente este, ha hecho lo necesario. En la presentación de hoy día ha resaltado algunos temas que me parecen muy interesantes. Yo voy a hacer una presentación muy breve, 10-15 minutos, para luego abrir un poco el campo a algunas preguntas que consideren necesarias. Amanda, ¿podrían poner el, mi presentación acá, por favor? Una de las cosas interesantes mientras se soluciona el problema de logística, eh, voy a tomar algunos de los elementos que Estefan ha mencionado en su presentación. ¿no? Hablar en 15 minutos de una ley de decomiso sin condena es evidentemente imposible, pero sí me gustaría resaltar algunos temas que Estefan ha mencionado en el contexto particular de América Latina. ¿no? En América Latina, como ustedes saben, existe... 
una ley, la ley de decomiso, la ley de extinción de dominio, que es una ley de, de origen colombiano inicialmente, que tiene unos 30 años circulando en el continente, que si podríamos hablar de darwinismo legislativo de alguna manera, es la ley que más se ha desarrollado y la que más se impone en América Latina en este momento. Eh, hay muchos países que la tienen en diferentes modelos, civil, administrativo, eh, o sui generis, independiente, autónoma del proceso penal. Y ahora me gustaría presentar eh, las características de esta ley en el, como una respuesta a lo que el doctor Casela ha venido mencionando. ¿no? Entonces, la extinción de dominio es, como el, es también una acción de carácter real, dirigida contra el activo, que es independiente del proceso penal, vamos a ver si es autónoma completamente del proceso penal, pero en todo caso, en América Latina, en la mayor parte de estados, se maneja como una acción completamente independiente del proceso penal. Es decir, existe una estructura en la mayor parte de países, con jueces especializados, fiscales especializados y con una ley que es distinta a la del Código Penal. Es decir, hemos creado en América Latina, en la mayor parte de países, una estructura que es eh, organizacional, una unidad dentro del Ministerio Público que persigue los activos independientemente de los eh, fiscales penales. Y eso, eso acaba de mencionar el doctor Casella que tiene en Estados Unidos, es el, un solo fiscal el que aglutina en ambas competencias, en sus competencias, la posibilidad de utilizar el decomiso sin condena o el decomiso con condena. En el Perú tenemos a dos entidades completamente separadas, ¿no? Eh, es una herramienta de política criminal. ¿no? Los, las exposiciones de motivos de todas las leyes de extinción de dominio en América Latina la mencionan como tal. De hecho, existe una ley modelo de, las, eh, de la Organización de Estados Americanos que promueve eh, el, la herramienta de esa manera. Como una ley, eh, bueno, este ha sido más claro en decir que la decomiso sin condena en Estados Unidos llena los vacíos que el derecho penal no puede llenar. En, el, en la ley modelo hay esa lógica también de interdependencia, de intercomunicación entre ambos modelos. Hay algunos problemas, está claro, sobre todo en el ámbito de la cooperación internacional, Vemos que no hay armonización, todas las leyes parten de una idea, ¿no? tienen una estructura, pero se han ido desarrollando distintamente en los países. En Argentina, por ejemplo, la extinción de dominio es puramente civil. En el Perú y en otros países es una ley, como decía hace un momento, completamente independiente. Otro de los problemas que vemos es la práctica internacional. No, Existen, no hay eh, un número importante de casos a nivel internacional donde los países hayan podido recuperar activos con, con la aplicación de esta ley. El Perú es probablemente una excepción en esta regla, ha logrado, yo calculo, unos 9, 10 casos internacionales, los operadores de justicia están aquí hoy día, así que les van a poder hacer las preguntas que requieran también. Pero esta parte me parece es importante porque la ley de extinción de dominio ha estado confrontada de alguna manera a las leyes particularmente europeas de centros financieros internacionales, y nos hemos podido ver, ¿no? En la herramienta que tenemos en América Latina, la hemos podido ver en los ojos de estos estados que tienen mucha más experiencia. Hablo de Suiza, de Luxemburgo, por ejemplo, de Liechtenstein, en el, en el ámbito del, 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 de la ley de decomiso. Hemos podido ver nuestras falencias y hemos podido ver a partir de la implementación de cómo se pueden utilizar estas herramientas. Básicamente, estamos hablando de lo mismo. ¿no? en todos los estados. Es simplemente o probablemente un problema de comunicación, pero estamos siempre hablando de lo mismo, de una acción de carácter real, que es independiente del proceso penal, que aplica un estándar de ley distinto al penal, el balance de probabilidades, y que se dirige contra el activo y no contra la persona. ¿Cómo se implementa esto en las leyes individuales? Pues bueno, como decía, bastante creatividad y sobre todo... Eh, eh, lo que ha generado efectivamente eh, distintas posiciones, distintos procedimientos eh, en la aplicación de esta ley en América Latina. Eh, creo que es una ley exitosa, creo que es una buena ley, la extinción de dominio. Existe, como les decía, una ley modelo promovida a nivel continental y ICAR y mi equipo y todos los cooperantes aquí están trabajando en que esa implementación se haga de acuerdo a los estándares internacionales. Sobre ese punto en particular, me voy a detener un, un momento, y una de las cosas que hemos visto, y probablemente los países de África, los países lusófonos que quieran implementar esas leyes, van a ver eh, a una plétora de, de especialistas, a una plétora de opiniones, a una plétora de modelos de ley que se vienen desarrollando en distintos países, 
Y lo que hemos conseguido, decía, es una, básicamente una desarmonización dentro de un esfuerzo enorme de armonización que se tiene que hacer en este tipo de leyes. La propuesta eh, de la que les vengo a hablar hoy día es utilizar una estructura un poco más clara, una estructura un poco más probada, que son los, el derecho internacional de los derechos humanos, como un, como un, como un límite o como una... Eh, visión organizacional del decomiso sin condena y con condena además, ¿no? Vamos a ver un momento cómo... ¿Y por qué los derechos fundamentales? Primero porque es el principio de supremacía. En, en los derechos eh, más desarrollados, digamos, eh, en Europa, eh, en América Latina un poco menos, tenemos este, estos modelos de control de convencionalidades, ¿no? De control de constitucionalidad. Es decir, las leyes de decomiso sin condena nacen ya a partir de un entendimiento profundo de los derechos humanos en este tema, ¿no? El principio de supremacía. El principio de universalidad. Los derechos humanos se aplican a todos los pueblos en realidad, ¿no? Si bien existen diferencias en su aplicación y las Cortes Internacionales de Derechos Humanos no comparten en algunos casos o las subtilidades de la aplicación de, lo, de las cartas fundamentales, es, rea, es una realidad que esos derechos, particularmente el derecho de propiedad como está desarrollado, le pertenecen a la humanidad entera. No hay derechos humanos africanos o derechos humanos latinoamericanos o europeos, son los derechos humanos. Y el otro principio es el principio de la practicabilidad de los derechos humanos. Es decir, no estamos hablando de cuestiones etéreas o abstractas, estamos hablando más bien de cosas concretas, donde existe ya una abundancia de jurisprudencia en la materia. En la Corte Europea de Derechos Humanos tiene al menos 20 años decidiendo sobre aspectos esenciales de los decomisos con o sin condena de los que hemos venido hablando ahora. Lógicamente, como toda corte, no está exenta de contradicciones. Yo prefiero verlas como una evolución en el razonamiento de los jueces de Estrasburgo, pero en realidad sí hay algunas posiciones que todavía se tienen que ir precisando y que seguramente se van a ir precisando a través del tiempo. Entonces, ¿de qué derechos fundamentales estamos hablando? Yo he ido a tantas conferencias en, en estos últimos años donde los derechos fundamentales se utilizan básicamente para decir que esta ley es, es atentatoria de los derechos humanos. A mí me gusta usar los derechos humanos para decir que esta ley es más bien compatible con ellos. Pero para ello tenemos que entender de qué se trata. ¿no? En América Latina hemos entrado al ámbito del derecho de propiedad a través de modificaciones constitucionales o de interpretaciones un poco límite eh, de, de los preceptos que protegen a la Constitución en el proceso, en, en, en el Estado, a nivel constitucional. En Europa se ha utilizado eh, este concepto de propiedad que ustedes ven, es decir, de considerar la propiedad como un derecho absoluto, pero de admitir también que la propiedad puede sufrir limitaciones, ¿no? Y las limitaciones están consideradas como un, un control de la propiedad de acuerdo al interés general, ¿no? Y es la lógica que tenemos en el Perú, la lógica tiene Colombia, de tener una propiedad que se utiliza socialmente, razonablemente, pero dentro de los cánones, dentro de los límites de la ley, ¿no? Esas declaraciones como que la, el derecho no protege la propiedad adquirida ilícitamente que tenemos, bueno, esa es una evidencia, en realidad, una tautología. Está claro que el derecho no puede... La, la interpretación que se ha hecho en Europa sobre este tipo de derecho es mucho más simple y entendida en la manera de que los decomisos constituyen de facto una perturbación del derecho de propiedad y son considerados en la jurisprudencia como una medida de control de la propiedad. Y el otro derecho más interesante es el derecho al juicio justo, ¿no? Y el derecho al juicio justo es bastante relevante, me parece a mí, vamos a dejarnos acá un momento, porque delimita claramente desde la perspectiva de los derechos humanos qué cosa se puede hacer en un decomiso sin condena y qué cosa se podría hacer eventualmente en un decomiso con condena, ¿no? Conviction based, como decía. Eh, la lógica del Tribunal Europeo, la lógica de los derechos humanos es admitir claramente que los activos ilícitos se pueden recuperar porque son los, el producto del crimen. ¿no? En, en algunos países en América Latina le llamamos efectos y ganancias a lo que en la mayor parte de países y en la doctrina internacional se conoce como los productos del crimen. Es decir, los, aquellos activos que provienen directa o indirectamente de la comisión de un delito. Y aquí debo enfatizar nuevamente que en la mayor parte de las leyes de extinción de dominio de América Latina y en la ley modelo también, estamos hablando de delitos penales concretamente, como lo acaba de mencionar el doctor Estefan también. ¿no? Estamos hablando que el gobierno, que el Estado, que la, el, los, eh, las unidades persecutorias tienen que probar que un delito se ha cometido. Lo que es interesante es probar en qué estándar se ha cometido ese delito. Eso es lo que hace la verdadera diferencia entre lo que vemos acá, civil y penal. Bueno, 
la, el Tribunal Europeo hace una línea, eh, traza una línea más o menos clara en lo que constituye el ámbito civil y el ámbito penal. ¿no? El ámbito civil, la Corte lo llama una contestación de carácter civil, mientras el ámbito penal es una acusación en materia penal. ¿no? Los derechos del juicio justo se aplican indistintamente según nos encontremos en el lado izquierdo o en el lado derecho de nuestra pantalla. Si nos encontramos en el lado izquierdo, el tribunal considera que estamos ante una acción que, es, que se dedica básicamente a restablecer un status quo ex ante, es decir, que ataca a la propiedad lícita porque proviene, porque hay una causalidad, porque hay un nexo con la comisión de un delito. No podemos hablar ahí de una sanción penal, porque el activo que le estamos retirando al criminal es un activo que nunca debió estar allí. ¿No? Entonces la naturaleza de esa acción en realidad se convierte en una naturaleza civil, de carácter civil, y se les va a aplicar, según la jurisprudencia, todas las, todas las derechos que tienen que ver con el juicio civil y no con el juicio penal. Y eso no significa justamente que haya algún tipo de, pro, de problema a nivel de los derechos humanos. Entonces, ¿qué cosas hacemos normalmente en civil? Instrumentos del delito, productos del delito, y en América Latina hemos incluido los objetos del delito también, ¿no? que es definido como el objeto sobre el cual recae la actividad delictiva, el crimen. En esta lógica eh, del civil se pueden decomisar también eh, instrumentos del delito, propiedad, pero de manera bastante eh, diferenciada en los distintos países que estamos viendo. Por ejemplo, en Suiza no se puede ser considerado el dinero en efectivo, el cash, no puede ser considerado un instrumento del delito. Y así cada país ha venido diseñando distintas formas de cómo atacar a los instrumentos del delito, que como dijo también Estefan hace un momento, son por lo general bienes lícitos, propiedad lícita que ha sido instrumentalizada para cometer delitos. El criterio fundamental para atacar delitos es la proporcionalidad nuevamente, ¿no? Y vamos a ver cómo ha manejado la Corte este tipo de situaciones. En el ámbito penal, por otro lado, podemos también atacar productos y efectos del delito, está claro, los objetos y los instrumentos con mayor razón, y podemos, según vemos en el slide, apl aplicar eh, algunos, algunos, algunas tipologías de decomiso que son problemáticas en el ámbito del decomiso sin condena, pero que son corrientes, son ordinarias en Europa eh, en el ámbito penal. Por ejemplo, el decomiso por valor equivalente. Por ejemplo, el decomiso de activos mezclados. ¿no? Por ejemplo, el decomiso extendido, que se encuentra tipificado en algunos países, particularmente en los países del Common Law. ¿Por qué no se pueden hacer o por qué no se podrían hacer este tipo de decomisos en el ámbito civil? Yo estoy seguro de que este tipo de, de herramientas serían útiles también en el ámbito civil, pero esta definición que hace el tribunal nos da una, un indicativo, una, una idea, de que no se va a poder hacer porque requiere el análisis de una culpabilidad. ¿no? El decomiso extendido, por ejemplo, requiere la condena. Si yo condeno a una persona y le digo, señor, usted es culpable de haber cometido tráfico de drogas, puedo iniciar presunciones y decir, todos los activos que ese señor tiene en los últimos dos años son considerados también productos del crimen. ¿no? Esa amalgama, esa asociación, se es posible porque ha habido un valor sobre la culpabilidad de la persona y porque su responsabilidad penal ha sido encontrada. ¿No? Eh, entonces, acá, te, a ver, acá les voy a dejar algunos, algunos de los, este, no sé qué pasó, tenía otros slides. Bueno, les voy a dejar en el slide algunas de las, de las recomendaciones que ha precisado, el, el, de las decisiones que ha eh, emitido el, el Tribunal Europeo de Derechos Humanos sobre estos puntos, pero básicamente se limita en, en, a decir que para que exista una buena protección en el ámbito del decomiso sin condena se necesita básicamente una base legal, un interés público y la aplicación proporcionada de la ley. En la extinción de dominio creo que cumple esos, esos requisitos fundamentales, es una eh, base legal formal a diferentes niveles, eh, corresponde a un interés público preponderante recuperar activos de la criminalidad económica y además se debería hacer, se debería aplicar de manera proporcional aplicando los estándares internacionales que son bastante conocidos en la materia. ¿no? Este es el modelo que hemos utilizado en América Latina, es un modelo me parece a mí que es viable conceptualmente, me parece que es un modelo que se podría, independientemente del nombre o como lo llamen, pero la ley de extinción de dominio, de las leyes que hemos podido mapear en América Latina, tanto en Brasil, en Chile o en los países que no las tienen, es, me parece una ley que ha adquirido una complejidad tal 
que requiere, que podría servir de modelo para la implementación de este tipo de herramientas, no solamente en América Latina, en África también y eventualmente en Europa. ¿Por qué no? Muchísimas gracias. Me voy a quedar acá y habremos el para algunas preguntas. Gracias. Thank you, Mr. Stefan, for your great presentation. And uh, but I want to make a question to Mr. Oscar. I will make in, do. I will do in Spanish to understand it's better. Apologies. La cuestión es la siguiente: es que en su presentación muy interesante eh, ha dicho que las eh, non-conviction based forfeiture en Perú eh, no son, digamos, eh, eh, pierdas o confiscos o decomisos de naturaleza sancionatoria, no son de naturaleza penal. Por lo menos lo he entendido así, ¿no? Pero después ha añadido algo muy relevante, ha dicho, es una herramienta de política criminal. ¿Cómo es posible tenerlo seguro que no es sancionatorio, que no tiene nada que ver con, con la cuestión penal, pero sigue siendo una herramienta de política criminal? Porque para mí, por lo menos, la, la política criminal, digamos que es una parte de todo el derecho penal, y por eso se cumple finalidades de política criminal, de algún modo tiene que tener relevancia eh, penal, sancionatoria. No sé si sí, me quedo, he entendido. Me queda muy clara la pregunta. Me queda muy clara la pregunta. A ver, eh, creo, nuevamente, ¿no? Creo que tenemos que regresar a lo básico, de la, a los conceptos verdaderamente elementales, aquellos que, que aprendimos en la facultad de Derecho, ¿no? Si hablamos de, de efectos civiles de una sanción, no, perdón, de efectos civiles en estos casos, de una dinámica civil, acabo de explicar que nos referimos a tratar de recuperar los activos que están vinculados a un crimen, ¿no? que hay un nexo causal. ¿no? Son criminales, no deberían estar allí, entonces el atacarlos no se puede considerar una sanción penal. Una sanción penal, definida de la manera clásica, es una medida retrospectiva que tiene un efecto dañoso contra el que la recibe. ¿Podemos decir que si le quitamos una casa a un criminal tiene un efecto dañoso a nivel del ámbito de propiedad? Yo creo que no, ¿no? Entonces, ¿cuándo podemos decir que tiene un efecto dañoso? Cuando la medida es de carácter retrospectivo y le quita algo a la persona. Por eso es que en los, que en los, eh, en los modelos de decomisos, por ejemplo, por valor equivalente, ¿por qué le retiramos el activo a la persona, no? La persona, imaginemos este ejemplo, una persona ha recibido un millón de dólares en el marco de un contrato corrupto. Ese, contra, ese millón de dólares lo ha desaparecido, ya no existe más. La justicia dice, yo le voy a atacar este activo contra la casa que él heredó de la abuela, que vale también un millón de dólares por hipótesis, digamos. ¿no? Es propiedad lícita, ¿no? Es propiedad lícita. Pero, ¿y por qué se la estamos quitando? Se la estamos quitando por un tipo de comportamiento que esta persona ha tenido, ¿no? A partir de lo que ya se ha aprobado en, una, en un proceso penal. Entonces, es justificable que se pueda atacar la propiedad ilícita. En Estados Unidos, ha explicado el doctor Casella, no se puede hacer eso. Yo considero que según los estándares que la Corte ingresa, ¿no? que ha, ha propuesto, tampoco se podría. Porque ese decomiso, del ese, esa extinción o decomiso del valor que es ilícito, corresponde a una, a una, podría corresponder, según esos estándares, a una sanción pecuniaria, pecuniaria camuflada. Ahora, sobre su... su, su su eh, posición sobre por qué existen leyes civiles en el ámbito de la persecución penal o por qué una ley civil puede ser de carácter de política criminal. Creo que la, la, la cooperación judicial internacional en materia penal nos ha dado una pista sobre eso. Es una pregunta muy compleja en realidad, ¿no? Pero en los, en los eh, países de derecho civil vemos que los crímenes tienen distintos efectos administrativos, civiles, ¿no? 
En el ámbito de la cooperación judicial internacional, nos hemos querido alejar del proceso penal para poder tener las virtudes que el doctor Estefan ha explicado, para tener aplicar estándares de prueba, para ser más maleables, para ser, digamos, más aplicar estándares menores en el proceso. Pero por esa razón nos hemos alejado. En los, hace los 10, 15 años, la mayor parte de decomisos sin condenas, como es la ley nuestra en, en Perú, aplican, eh, tienen como fundamento los derechos reales o la protección del derecho civil, ¿no? En realidad, hemos entendido en el ámbito internacional que todas estas eh, denominaciones, calificaciones de la ley, no son relevantes, ¿no? no son relevantes. El Tribunal Europeo ha dicho que lo que es relevante en realidad es la realidad sustantiva de la ley, ¿no? Entonces, cuando hemos entrado en contacto con países como Suiza, por ejemplo, o como Luxemburgo, ellos no han tenido ningún problema en entender que esta ley, a pesar de ser civil, y a pesar de tener de estar muy separada del estándar penal, contribuye a los propósitos, a los objetivos de política criminal. Y por tanto, es una ley de política criminal. Y lo que nos lleva a otra conclusión, mucho más interesante todavía, que la extinción de dominio en el ámbito internacional se tiene que aplicar en el contexto de la cooperación judicial internacional en materia penal, y no como en otros casos que hemos visto en El Salvador, en Panamá, de la cooperación internacional en materia civil. ¿no? Estamos hablando de un law enforcement tool, de, un verdadero, de una verdadera evolución en la concepción de la persecución del delito. ¿no? Y en ese contexto es como lo entendemos en América Latina. Obrigada. Eu vou passar uma pergunta do, do, Ebe, do Ebe Nenar. A pessoa quer, antes de mais, dar os parabéns a Stefa Cacela pela excelente apresentação. Depois, gostaria de perguntar se, no caso do, do exemplo que deu sobre um traficante que utiliza a casa da namorada, a qual sabia do tráfico para guardar a droga, e a droga custa 50 mil dólares e a casa custa um milhão, a pergunta se há ou não possibilidade de confisco da casa atendendo ao princípio da proporcionalidade e se, for, se não for possível eh, o confisco da casa, e não tendo a namorada uh, outro bem, o que é que pode ser feito? Eu espero ter tra transmitido minimamente bem a pergunta. No, you, you asked the question uh, very well, and it's an excellent question. The application of the proportionality rule is not simple. It's easy to state the rule, Forfeiture should be proportional to the seriousness of the crime and very difficult to decide where is the bright line between a forfeiture which is proportional and one that is not. So I gave an example where it's obvious if there's only 10 euros worth of drugs in the house worth a million euros that that would be disproportional. But where would you draw the line? 50,000 euros worth of drugs? 500,000 euros worth of drugs? I, my personal view is that we, spend too much time talking about the value of the property and not enough time talking about the degree to which the property was used to commit the crime or how necessary it was to commit the crime. For example, suppose two people commit exactly the same crime. They, tra they transport drugs in an automobile. One uses a 15 year old pickup truck. The other uses a brand new Lexus. Should it make any difference which, how much the property is worth? Should we say poor person forfeits his pickup truck because it's worth less than the amount of the drugs, but rich person gets to keep his Lexus because it's worth more than the drugs? Or is it more important to say they committed exactly the same crime and the degree to which the truck or the car was used to commit the crime was the same, and that's the focus. We would, we would not want to say that a, a rich person gets to keep his car because it's worth more than a poor person, nor would we want to say that rich people forfeit their property because it's not as important to them as the pickup truck is to the poor person. 
how the forfeiture affects the person economically is not the relevant question either. It's the degree to which the property was involved in the crime. Was it used over a long period of time? Was it used multiple times? Was it important or peripheral to the commission of the crime? I think those are the, of the factors. We've been litigating the proportionality question in the United States for 20 years since our Supreme Court, our constitutional court said that we had to consider proportionality. And um, we are still wrestling with the very question that was asked. And there is no, there's no simple answer. Um, judges look to all sorts of factors. What other penalties can be imposed and the factors that I mentioned uh, as well. Um, so all I can say is that that's the right question and that there's no simple answer but I've given you my sense as to what the right considerations are. Uh, first of all, uh, I'll make the question in English because it's for Mr. Casella. Uh, first of all, congratulations for your presentation, Oscar and Stefan. They raised so, in, so many interesting questions that we can uh, discuss later. But for now, I just want to know better how the law operates in the U.S. as to let, let us get your example of the drug dealer that was there. Let's say that you find some documents in his car that proves that he was paying, he was paying bribes to politicians to get you know, laws in favor for his, his activities. But you cannot, you, you managed to prove that he paid the bribes, probably it was paid on, on money, cash, but you do not find where this money is. Uh, you have the proof that the bribe was paid, for example, 10 million. Uh, would it still be a possible to use the non-conviction base for feature for this money that you do not know where it is? For example, I don't know, it may be, should, it may be considered as a value judgment on, on the NCB. Is it possible to use it? Or if not, what other tools that you have in the US to, to do that? Well, that's an excellent question too. Um, our non-conviction based forfeiture law is strictly limited to property traceable to the crime. We do not have value based non-conviction based forfeiture. We have value based criminal forfeiture. The courts will often say the defendant committed a $1 million fraud and he spent the money on wine, women and song and we don't want his wine, we don't want his women, we certainly don't want his song. <laughs> we want $1 million and so we will issue a value based judgment, <laughs> um, which is sound policy. <laughs> Uh, but in a civil or non-conviction based case, we must find the actual million dollars. And that's a limit on our ability to use non-conviction based forfeiture. It's a reason why prosecutors prefer criminal forfeiture if they have a defendant because they can get the value based judgment. But um, now there, that doesn't mean we, you could not enact legislation in the United States or anywhere that allowed for a non-conviction based um, value-based judgment. We, we, we don't have that. The state of New York does, for one example, but it, it comes up all the time. In the cases of the Russian yachts, we can prove that this Russian oligarch committed crimes in, in Russia or committed crimes elsewhere in the world, that he violated sanctions, he did all kinds of mean, nasty, ugly, and horrible things. But how do we prove that this yacht was derived from those crimes. Maybe he is also in the oil business and maybe he bought the yacht with his oil proceeds. Because we are limited to the, the connection between the property and the crime, we have to prove the crime and the connection. And that's a limitation. We, we, we understand that that's a limitation. And uh, I have suggested that we might want to relax that requirement in order to get a value-based judgment, but it hasn't been done in the United States. Muito obrigado. Uh, meu nome é Bernardino Delgado, de Cabo Verde. Vou falar em português. Uh, em primeiro lugar, os meus parabéns pelas apresentações aqui feitas, que demonstram 
uh, um conhecimento profundo sobre o tema que nos une aqui. Uh, tenho algumas questões relativamente uh, ao processo de confis sem condenação. Uh, referiu uh, o orador Stefan Cassela que o processo começa sempre com a apreensão. Uh, a questão que eu queria colocar é se essa apreensão tem um prazo, um prazo limite uh, dentro do qual deve ser feita a demonstração da existência do crime. Uh, tem outra questão relativamente a também a necessidade da comprovação da existência. Should, should I answer the first one first? I'll answer your question about the deadline, and then maybe you could ask me the second okay. question. Is that okay? Um, that's it, it's important procedurally that a seizure be followed fairly quickly with a judicial action that gives the property owner the opportunity to have his day in court to defend his property. So how many days is somewhat arbitrary, but in the United States, the rule is that if property is seized, notice must be sent to the property owner within 60 days of his right to intervene. If he doesn't intervene, the property is forfeited by default. If he does intervene, then the government must within 90 more days bring an action in court. Now, that action may take a long time to resolve because, as I've explained, there's litigation over who has standing and proof, and uh, there's um, what we call discovery, where there's a reciprocal exchange of evidence. So the, the process may take a while, but it must be initiated within 90 days of the uh, making of a claim to intervene in the process. Obrigado. Uh... A segunda questão é se nessa segunda fase haverá também um prazo para demonstrar a existência do crime. E se uh, estamos na, num confisco sem condenação, porque é que ainda é necessário demonstrar a existência de um crime que, como sabemos, muitas vezes depende de uma investigação, poderá ser... Uh, Longa. Obrigado. Well, the reason we still have to prove the existence of a crime is because this is a law enforcement tool. It's another way of enforcing the criminal law. The prosecutor says, I can enforce the criminal law by trying to get a jail sentence for this individual. I can enforce the criminal law by trying to impose a fine. I can enforce the criminal law by trying to get restitution uh, paid to the victims, or I can enforce the criminal law by bringing this non-conviction based action. But in all of those instances, it derives from the fact that a crime occurred. Now, you, your point is that sometimes the criminal investigation takes time, and that's true. Um, we deal with that in two ways. One is if we seize the property, it's only seized because you had some reasonable basis to believe that it was involved in a crime where the judge would not have issued the warrant in the first place. So at least you have some beginning for the belief that this is criminal property. And in, in the course of the, of the non-conviction based case, each side gets to serve the other with demands for evidence. If, for example, this is a very typical case, the police sees $100,000 in cash from someone in his car, we would serve him with requests for his tax returns, for his employment records, for his bank records, to find out where did you get this money from? And if he's unable to establish any source of the money, that's strong evidence that this came from some criminal activity. In addition, we might have a dog might alert to the smell of drugs on the currency. There may be, uh, the currency may have been packaged in rubber bands uh, and, and put in sealed plastic bags, which is what drug dealers do. So there may be circumstantial evidence that this is drug proceeds. And it's important to understand that in this non-conviction based context, the government's burden is balance of the probabilities, which is a much easier burden to meet than the beyond a reasonable doubt standard that would apply if we brought a criminal case. 
So, in, so that's one way in which we deal with the fact that we need to prove a criminal case. We serve the other side with demands for evidence, we take depositions, and we, um, we use the circumstances. The second way is if there is going to be a criminal prosecution, but the investigation is ongoing and is long, we ask the judge to suspend or stay the non-conviction based case while the criminal case goes first. So the non-conviction based case serves to freeze the property, but then nothing happens in it until the criminal case is over. If they're going to, if this is a situation where there are parallel non-conviction based and criminal cases, we don't need a criminal case in order to bring a non-conviction based case. But if there are both, then the criminal case will generally go first and the judge will suspend the civil case until the criminal case is over. Bom dia, eu também vou falar em português. Amélia Munguambe, de Moçambique. Queria começar por felicitar as duas apresentações, Dr. Stefan e Dr. Oscar. Uh, são apresentações que certamente para países como o meu, que ainda não adotaram este sistema, vão apoiar na reflexão e eventualmente na definição do modelo a seguir. Uh, tinha aqui uma questão, acho que uma, o doutor eh, Bernardino já avançou, que era sobre a necessidade de demonstração do crime para se poder fazer o confisco civil. Então, em relação a estas, ficámos ultrapassados. Mas, continua a segunda, é, se não conseguir-se demonstrar o crime, qual é o procedimento a seguir? É, dando aqui um exemplo, nós temos que os bancos têm um dever de comunicação de transações suspeitas. E... O que está por detrás desta comunicação é a suspeita de branqueamento de capitais. Se durante a investigação podemos até identificar os bens, mas não conseguimos trazer o crime precedente que vai demonstrar o branqueamento e não há aqui, por exemplo, a definição do crime, qual é o procedimento que depois se segue? Obrigada. Uh, well, thank you for the question. And first, let me say that I had the opportunity to visit your country to Mo in Mozambique some years ago and speak at the uh, at the embassy uh, to a group of prosecutors and uh, enjoyed that opportunity very much a beautiful country. Um, yes, it's true that we get these suspicious uh, transaction reports from banks and they are good law enforcement leads. They indicate that this is something that uh, is suspicious and perhaps should be inquired into in greater detail. And often all you have is um, sort of unexplained suspicious transactions or unexplained wealth. In the United States, unexplained wealth is not sufficient basis to bring a forfeiture action. Other countries, it is different. In other countries, unexplained wealth in and of itself is a basis for confiscation. And the burden is then on the wealthy person to explain his wealth, because if he cannot explain it, then it's unexplained wealth, and then he must forfeit it. We cannot do that. We have to have a nexus to a crime. But what's important to understand is the circumstantial evidence. If, you, if somebody is engaged in um, the kinds of activities that are consistent with criminal activity, uh, for example, I'm thinking of a money laundering case where someone was collecting large sums of money in the United States and claimed that he was sending it to Mexico because he wanted to start an ostrich farm. Um, odd. Um, the circumstances were that he would meet with individuals in dark places, use code names, um, deal solely in cash, keep no written records, and so forth. Those circumstances, when added up one on top of the other, were sufficient ultimately to prove that this money was criminal proceeds being laundered to Mexico. The unusual explanation, I want to start an ostrich farm. The fact that he could not prove that he had any ostriches uh, or any uh, 
knowledge of the ostrich farming business, the fact that the money was being transacted uh, in this surreptitious, very suspicious manner. All of that um, was considered to be sufficient to meet the burden of balance of the probabilities. Um, but you, you're correct. I cannot underestimate the difficulties. Just because someone has unexplained wealth or is acting in a suspicious manner is not by itself sufficient. Microphone. Oh, over here. Só, antes de mais, muito, muito bom dia. Quero cumprimentar os dois, os dois conferencistas, em especial o, o Dr. Stefan de Cacela. É sempre um gosto ouvi-lo. De tarde, o Dr. Oscar Solarzan vai nos falar da, da cooperação internacional, mas eu atrevia-me a perguntar ao, ao Dr. Stefan de Cacela qual é a experiência norte-americana no domínio do reconhecimento internacional do, da civil confiscation fora dos sistemas da common law. Uh, good question. Um, in the United States, we can recover the proceeds of a foreign crime and return it to the foreign country in two ways. If in your country you are able to obtain from your court a confiscation order, criminal or non-conviction based, that can be sent to the United States, registered and enforced under US law and the property recovered and returned to your country. This happens all the time. Um, I've worked on several cases involving Brazil. Brazil obtains a confiscation order, uh, sends it to the United States. The attorney general reviews it, uh, determines that it was obtained in the proper manner and uh, submits it to a US court. And the US court enters an order that this property shall be confiscated and returned to Brazil. If your country is unable to obtain such an order because you do not have a confiscation law or don't have the appropriate confiscation law, then the second alternative is to provide all of the evidence of the foreign crime to a prosecutor in the United States, who then will bring an action in the United States. Uh, in some years ago, in Equatorial Guinea, the, in Africa, um, the son of the president used a great deal of money that was stolen from the public uh, treasury to buy a, a, a jet airplane in the United States and to buy a lot of memorabilia from Michael Jackson's tours. He was a great collector of Michael Jackson memorabilia. And with the evidence from Equatorial Guinea, we were able to bring the action in the United States to recover that property. Because we did not have a foreign order, we had to bring our own action to do that. It's a difficult thing to do because you need foreign evidence. And so this doesn't happen as often as uh, we would like it to work because you need to be able to prove the foreign crime using the foreign evidence, which not, you may not always be able to obtain. But that is the second way of doing it if there is no foreign confiscation order. Okay, okay thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we have to stop here. Um, there are another panelists speaking. We will be very happy to answer the questions. We will, Professor Stefan will be this afternoon here. And, and there is a slot this afternoon after lunch where we will speak about mutual legal assistance and non-conviction based confiscation. So thank you very much for this panel and let's um, welcome the other panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan.